If you said there is no good form of blackness, none, and don't ever try to stop being black because you can't, you can't get out of it, we'd go, wow, that's a racist. <laughs> that's a big racist right there. Well, it's racist when they do it about white people as well. If you took what is now said about white people in America, Britain, and elsewhere, and said it about any other group, you would be regarded rightly as a racist. Douglas Murray, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, and great to be with you in person for the first time. It's been too long since you've been on the show, but this is our first time in person. When was I last on? Two years ago-ish, <laughs> paperback of Madness of Crowds. That's right. And the world's only got better. Oh, it's so much better. So we've got a couple of hours today, and hopefully we'll go through some stuff that maybe you haven't spoken about before at the end. But first, there is some more pressing news. As you are aware, Dumbledore is a proud member of the LGBT community, but... As you may not be aware, he is not allowed to be his true self in China. Did you see this? No. Let me tell you about this. I mean, Dumbledore kept coming out. It's, he, he, was... he came out more times than Sam Smith. <laughs> so, references to a gay relationship were edited out of Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore by Warner Brothers for the film's release in China. As a studio, we're committed to safeguarding the integrity of every film we release, and that extends to the circumstances that necessitate making nuanced cuts in order to respond sensitively to a variety of in-market factors, Warner Brothers said in a statement to Variety. Our hope is to release the features worldwide as released by their creators, but historically, we have faced small edits made in local markets. How gay was Dumbledore? In Six seconds of dialogue. What is it like? It's dialogue. It's dialogue. Oh, it's dialogue, not Yeah, not it's actual. not a full frontal scene. Come on, it's not. a film for children. Okay. But <laughs> my point is that uh, he said something to this guy about how I used to love you or something like that, uh, and it's been cut. Wasn't it? Ch- now, we saw Harry Potter on stage in New York with Jordan and Tammy Peterson only a couple of months ago. And if I remember rightly, there was some very slight allusion to gayness there. Yeah. The whole thing was homoerotic. I wouldn't agree with you there. <laughs> I, I thought there were lots of it. It was just charming. But the, the, uh, no, I, uh, there was some reference to it. Uh, didn't, because, uh, I mean, we don't know, I know this is Potterology, but I thought J.K. Rowling only said that Dumbledore was gay long after the whole franchise had been 2009, done. 2009, she posthumously brought Dumbledore posthumously out. Posthumously outed him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Richard Harris, who died, of course, had no idea he was playing a gay character. No, which would have probably influenced the role. Massively so, changed the role. Uh, yeah, the point just being that Hollywood, it, yeah. Hollywood to Florida is we say gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Hollywood to China is we'll say whatever you want. Please take our money. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, I mean, I've, I just have unending contempt for these people, as you probably guessed. And uh, the contempt is based on a lot of things. But one is the way in which these sorts of entertainment honchos and so on always, they just, their idea of bravery is poking at empty hornet's nests. And whenever they find a real hornet's nest, they just run a million miles. And that's why they're perfectly willing to weirdly melt down over Florida and to Santa's and a bill which is totally reasonable in my view to not like tell three-year-olds that they might wake up the next morning in a different sex like that's I don't think there's anything wrong with not teaching kindergartners crazy hundred gender two-spirit ideology which was come up with about yesterday and which they're still trying to work on to make make any sense at all which it never will it's it's just completely typical. The same people who have a meltdown about that happening and attack Florida uh, will be totally silent when the Communist Party of China expects different rules. That's uh, that's one of the ways in which the 21st century could go. You know, they just of, of course, of course, we would, we don't upset you, sir. Did Whilst, you see you know. that a trans author wrote a horror novel in which J.K. Rowling is burned alive by a trans woman? I didn't. I but didn't, you're missing I, out on everything. And I haven't even read that book. <laughs> no, it sounds like nobody has. I don't know. I don't know anymore. I'm, I don't know if it's yet to come out. But what I do know is that the Secrets of Dumbledore had a nine point seven million dollar first weekend in China, which meant that two out of every three people at the cinema was going to see wow. that film in China. 
Just tighten this in a little bit wow. for me, if you want. That's, that's uh, well, the, the rules are different there, aren't they? And the cynical corporations realize that. And uh, it, none of it surprises me at all. Um, this is how Hollywood and other companies operate. As I say, they, they, they pretend to be very, very brave. They give each other rewards for bravery. They, they meet up and slap each other on the back for bravery. They talk about human rights in Florida and lots of things like that. And then they um, just, of course, they do this in China. It's like Ricky Gervais said in the Golden Globes the other, the other year, you know, is if ISIS set up a streaming service, these people would run to it, you know. I mean, <laughs> of course they would. They'd work for it if the cash came in. I mean, uh, look at the, all these companies, Apple, and all, they're, they're all such damn cynics. They all know how to how play this sort of virtue signaling thing in America and totally different rules abroad. It's always been like that. It's always been like that. Um, but I, I, I am slightly amused still by this meltdown about the Texas thing. Did you see Jen Psaki the other day? She cried. She cried. She said, I don't know, I've just become very emotional about what's happening in Florida because people are mean. <clears throat> I go, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe she's just trying to make sure her job at MSNBC is secure. Uh, because if you express that amount of sentimentality and stupidity, then you're almost certain to keep a job at MSNBC. She could have got a Golden Globe for the performance. It, it was very, Do you think she believes it? Do you think? I don't know. I, I think these people wind themselves up about this stuff. They wind themselves up about issues that are that are just not relevant. Just, just the not line the between persona, performance, and identity kind yeah. of begins to get blurred. I mean. Psaki is obviously a White House press spokesperson. Is obviously a, she's a smart woman. She must know that the Florida bill in question doesn't say what she's pretending it says. Isn't going to do what she's pretending it'll do. She must know that. I mean, she's not stupid. Very stupid people who aren't informed might believe that it, that actually Governor Ron DeSantis has decided that you're not allowed to say the word gay in Florida. Uh, but I don't believe that somebody who's well informed could think that. So they they. They whip themselves up on on things that don't hurt them, you know. Have you ever used your gay privilege card? Well, on other gay men, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, I just how much do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of an intrusive question. Uh, um, uh, what do you mean? I mean, well, I this, is there not some sort of privilege? It's like a free extra shot at Starbucks or whatever. What do you get? Never, no, never that. Um, uh, I think I know what you're getting at. Uh, as it were, are there things I'm able to say and do that a straight person wouldn't? Yes. No. Uh, that would be the case if I was very left-wing or remotely left-wing, for sure. Um, but uh, since I'm, I've not got the correct views. So you're basically straight. I'm, I'm an honorary straight, if not worse. <laughs> I'm even worse straight than a traitor. heterosexual. It's that bad, Chris. <laughs> it's that disgusting and reprehensible that my views have ungayed me uh, and I don't have a minority card. Uh, that is actually the case. Uh, it honestly is. It's the same with women. Right-wing women are not really women. They have their woman card taken away. Uh, anyone who's right-wing and gay isn't actually gay. They have their gay card taken away and so on. Um and I just said there occasionally I hear people saying, oh, well, Douglas only gets away with sayings. I don't know if he's saying he's gay. And I, I think they, they don't really understand that's not the case. Um, I say what I think and I defend it pretty vigorously, I think, usually. And uh, I've never felt that I've had any extra leeway because I happen to be gay, partly because it's something I don't talk about very much because I don't think it's very interesting and I don't want to bang on about uninteresting things. But... Um, but also because I, I just I, I I I don't believe in and I, I may have said this to you before in private or in public, but the, I don't believe in the speaking as a pre prefix. I mean, I, I just don't believe in that. And even before I could identify what I didn't like about it, I didn't like it. I didn't like the sort of person who stood up and say. Um, so my parents were from Peru and Honduras, and I am a, a bisexual. I don't care. Get to the point. You know, doesn't matter to me. Stop it. Um, and people only ever did it if they had traits that they thought meant that they should grab the microphone. Is there not some validity to the experience that everybody has, which gives them a unique perspective on the world? Yeah, but that's endless. 
But everyone has that. Everyone's got a unique perspective. God damn it. I mean, every, every person in the world has a unique perspective. Identical twins each have unique perspectives from each other. That's not a very interesting observation. I mean, it's, it, we, we all have a unique perspective. Now, now, is a person who has been oppressed in some way, have they got a particularly inter interesting perspective? Well, on their uh, oppression, sure, and on subjects relating to it, but not on anything else. Um, and so I shouldn't take your advice on accounting or macroeconomics or something? Uh, definitely not. Whoa, run, <laughs> run a million miles and I'm trying to give you financial advice. Speaking as a gay man. Yeah, speaking as a gay man, you need to invest in ISIS. <laughs> I mean, like, um, no, it, it's... It's just I, I, all that sort of ridiculous validity seeking. Uh, I'm not in favour of, but no, I suppose there are some people who th who, who who think that I get away with cert saying certain of the things I do about highly contentious issues. For some, they try to find some reason for it, but it's definitely not because of the fact I happen to be gay. Because they say in my own experience, it's never been a um, anything I've benefited from uh, career wise. Certainly hasn't. Occasionally, it's been something I've suffered. From. For in a certain to a certain extent, or well, I don't really like to think in those terms, and certainly don't like to moan, uh, which makes me an unusual figure in this era. Of course, did you see that the libs of TikTok creator got mm. doxed by Taylor Lorenz? Oh yeah, it's so disgusting. Wasn't it? I love libs of TikTok. I mean, we wouldn't know about these maniacs. Uh, I think otherwise, I mean, I wouldn't sit on TikTok watching what a teacher from Minnesota was saying about you know their gender pronouns. Otherwise, there's not quite enough time in the day. And uh, and so Libs of TikTok did a great service, um, and uh, yeah, Taylor Renz of uh, the Washington Post. That's just such disgusting behavior. Long article. Do you read it? No, I didn't read the whole article. Long right. article. Serious. Yeah, I wish they'd have um, looked at Hunter Biden's laptop story at similar length. Uh, um, I mean, corruption in the first family. Um, would strike me as being a much more interesting subject than who runs Libs of TikTok. <laughs> <clears throat> but then, you know, Washington Post has its own priorities. But Taylor Lorenz is someone who broke down crying on MSNBC not long ago talking about online harassment. Yeah, well, all these people are bullies who, whenever they've finished bullying people, uh, pretend to be a victim. Uh, whenever they get caught out, they cry. Um, the Kathy Newman phenomenon, you know. Bully somebody. And then when you're caught out behaving badly, you present yourself as a victim. Nice, nice uh, turnaround there. Very, very common. So I think it was Julie Birchie who coined the term cry bullies for these people. Uh, cry bullies is a great term for our era. What know? do you mean by that? Cry bullies are, are, are people who, who go around bullying everyone. And then um, when they're caught or in any way criticized, cry. Um, uh, just immediately turn themselves into uh, the victim. Everyone knows this from children. I mean, there's a certain type of child who does that, and they should be slapped, or you know, in a country you're allowed to slap a child, um, uh, uh, or you know, otherwise, you know, disciplined to not behave like that. Uh, you know, th th these are sort of grown up Eric Cartmans, uh, maybe not even grown up. They're sort of Eric Cartman like figures. But they're horrible bullies, and nasty people who, when it's not going for them, go wow, wow. What do you think was the problem with Libs of TikTok as a as a channel? Is it because it's just bringing attention to things that the left would rather people not see? Well, it's not that it's just the left in particular. It's just, it's just this is what it. I mean, I don't look at TikTok, um, and by the way, I think it's a highly unstable platform. And obviously, it's Chinese Communist Party direct brainwashing so, us slowly. You know, I, it one is one video at a time. Yeah, all those things, and. Um, uh, so, so yeah, obviously, um, you know, these teachers and others who say these ridiculous and outlandish things. There was one who even said she was a witch. Did you see that one? No. There was some teacher who was like, you know, no, I'm a witch. And, you know, I told the students and they I had questions and that was, that was fine. I was like, make it a bit harder for us. I mean, you know, to actually say, you know, and I also practice witchcraft or something. It struck me as being, you know. It seems to me like it's a, a warning shot to any future potential people that would consider doing the same sort of thing because yeah. you know someone posts something on TikTok you're not not doing it to get attention yeah. like you, the the whole reason that you're doing it is to get attention but maybe not by 600,000 people on a Twitter account yeah, yeah they don't they want to be famous they don't want to be infamous um and uh once something highlights it to a, a group they would never have got to otherwise 
who don't see it favorably, it becomes a different thing, of course. Um, I mean, it's a form of that that thing in the era of the context collapse phenomenon that occurs with um, social media all the time. You know, context collapse being when the, uh, an out group discovers an in group's discussion and doesn't view it. What's an example of that? Oh, uh, um, banter between friends on texts, for instance, where a group of guys banter about stuff and including bad taste stuff joking about girls or whatever, somebody leaks it and an outgroup discovers it and thinks, how disgusting the way these men talk about women. Durham University got popped for this a couple of years ago. Uh, for, uh, there's, it, I mean, people are sort of wise up to now, but yeah, um, right, rugby teams quite often, you know, get done over for it. Um, uh, some, an outgroup discovers an in-group discussion. And, you know, it's understandable that... that um, that happens in our era because everybody has access to the click of a few buttons to expose a, an in-group's discussion. And it's really hard sometimes to discover what the context would be of a particular discussion. Um, so, I mean, that is something that goes on all the time at the moment, but, uh, but libs of TikTok is simply exposing what an in-group was hoping to be able to say to, the, to, to itself. And it's been discovered by an out-group, but the out-group really doesn't like it because it's teachers, you know, and things like that. It's, it's like, if, if, if it's just we, I mean, there's that one person on libs of TikTok I've seen several times is a totally deranged individual, a man who dresses as a woman and says he's trans and, uh, and, and I had a lipstick and like a hairy chest and, and like says, you know, um, yeah, I, he, he can't understand why people don't think he's a woman and call him sir and things, you know, well, I guess it's a fact you got a hairy chest and you know, look like a dude. Um, that's the problem. I just thought, you know, and uh, but there's like this this particular guy that he's like he comes back repeatedly like on one of them he's like you will respect us you will respect us and you go I don't want that person anywhere near uh, <laughs> members of the public you know? uh, it's really interesting to discover those people but but it, it's just but what the Washington Post did was 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 basically a punishment beating on the woman who who runs the libs of TikTok. It's a punishment beating and a warning to others. Well, the editor said that it was completely in line with the journalistic standards at the Washington Post. <laughs> well, that's true. But they amended the article to remove her real estate yes, license. Yes, that's right. Because that had doxed her. Did you know that there's another online influencer with the same name as the person that founded Libs of TikTok, who's the, the fallout from this has been so hard that a person that isn't the person that runs it but has the same name has also been getting harassed online. Doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't surprise me at all. Because Taylor Lorenz turned up at that lady's house. Yeah, right? yeah, She's, yeah. There's a video, uh, sorry, there's a photo of, of her, her standing at the door. Yeah, through the sort of... She's just a really nasty piece of work, Lorenz. It seems like it's not the first thing that no. she's done. I, this is the first time I've been introduced to her. Um, uh, lots of people uh, in America... In media knew about her, thought she was a kind of rogue, unpleasant, bad operator, and um, uh, this has just proven that. I mean, I mean, of course, it's, it's vile behaviour, and as I say, I mean, there is so much that's important to to write about, and in America, of all places, so many stories, such a rich environment for real investigative writing and journalism, and uh, to be going and exposing the identities of citizens who are reposting things from TikTok would strike me as being a very strange journalistic priority. Um, but don't forget, the truth dies in darkness. As the Washington Post tagline says, truth dies in darkness. So their view of themselves as the Washington Post is that absolutely, our democracy would not run. The world might not be free unless they can dox tic lives of TikTok. So... <laughs> That's there. <laughs> okay, so, new book. Indeed. War on the West, hiding a, a can of Diet Dr. Pepper, who we both want to be sponsored by if there's a... If there's any chance for sponsorship <coughs> from Dr. Pepper, Diet Dr. Pepper, I would welcome it. It'd be my first sponsorship deal. I would promise to carry it around all the time. We know that it's a, a legitimate love, but yeah. new book, very good. Congratulations. I know you've worked hard you. on it. Uh, how has the West been coaxed into hating itself oh by all sorts of means um but the first thing is just to establish that it has that i call it the war on the west because it seems to me that that everything that's western everything that's of the west is is in the process of being assaulted 
and uh, insulted and demeaned and diminished. And um, the rest of the world does not put itself through this. Um, there are lots of forms of anti-Westernism which are foreign. You know, there's Russian anti-Westernism, there's Chinese anti-Westernism, Middle Eastern anti-Westernism. All of these are interesting. But the, the most interesting one is um, Western anti-Westernism, and that's really what I'm writing about. The way in which the West has done itself over by demeaning and diminishing itself and attacking its own history, attacking its own heroes, bringing down its own heroes, destroying its own path, the past, carrying out iconoclastic attacks on its heroes and founders, um, insulting the majority population, the white population. So there is this strange war on white people in our day, which a lot of people even just hearing that phrase go, you know, worry, but it's absolutely the case. Racism in our day is rightly deemed to be totally impermissible in the public square, with one exception, which is white people, about whom you can say absolutely anything now. And people do, and I give a remorseless number of examples in the book. I mean, if if any group of people, if, if, if you took what is now said about white people in America, Britain, and elsewhere, and said it about any other group, you would be regarded rightly as a racist. Uh, in several, a lot of countries, you'd be locked up for hate speech. Uh, but this is now not just normal rhetoric, but instilled and installed in every area of government, in countries including Britain and the United States. It's instilled through the media um, through academics, through the military, through absolutely every level of our societies. Uh, white people are seen as being a problem and a, and a problem for whom a remedy must be found. Now, of course, some of the maniacs who have been pushing this, like Robin DiAngelo, who herself is white and is, of course, the author of White Fragility, which sold about half a million copies after the death of George Floyd, um, says there is no good form of being white. No good form of being white. And there's a rider. You also can't escape it. You can't escape it. So you can't like shift to another racial group. You can't identify as not being white if you're white. She doesn't know what it is. And I don't think anyone really does. It's a very weird category to even talk about people in these contexts you know but if you said that about any other group of people if you said there is no good form of blackness none and don't ever try to stop being black because you can't you can't get out of it we'd go wow that's a racist <laughs> that's a big racist right there well it's racist when they do it about white people as well uh, the talk of white privilege has become a racist trope, quite clearly. Uh, the talk of white tears, white female tears, try that any other way, black tears, black female tears. Oh, she's just crying black tears. Oh, you'd say, that's a, that's a racist. Uh, so it is when they say white tears. What about white rage, when the ones that they've, um, in, the, in this attempt to pathologize being white, uh, they've come up with most recently, particularly in the wake of January the 6th, white rage, uh, no less a figure than General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the US, testifying before Congress, uh, d uh, addressed the issue of so-called white rage, said, I want to learn about white rage. I want to find out what it is. Let's try the other way around one more time. Black rage. Let's look into it. Ooh, you'd say, that doesn't sound like a very nice thing to do. Why don't we just talk about rage in general? White rage, black rage, only one of those is a permissible thing to talk about. Only one of those you'd catch the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff using before Congress. Where does this asymmetry come from then? Is it because white people are seen to, it's always punching up toward white people? Is it this... Mm. current trend that we have toward anti-Westernism, colonialist, imperialists, reparations need to come mm -hmm. from the past, and that white people are and, and that skin color is a representation of that as an ideology or as a, a like the modern day um, tip of the spear of uh, of that history. I think it's an attempt to um, rectify a historic wrong and a wildly misguided attempt at it. So. 
I mean, I think we talked about this when we talked about the madness of crowds. We talked about the fact that there's there's such a thing as an overcorrection in social issues. You know, nobody denies that women historically were not able to make the same life choices as men were able to make. They didn't have as much freedom in in general. Um, they didn't. And so if you want to make up for that historic wrong, the obvious thing to do is just make everyone equal. A certain type of person says, no, we, we, we can make up it faster by punishing men for a time. Uh, nobody can deny that gay people historically were not treated equally as straight people. Uh, there's a type of person who says, let's uh, attack the heterosexuals for a bit, um, instead of saying, why don't we just have equality? Um, in the same way, nobody with any sense would be able to deny that historically racism has existed in countries of the West, as it has in all countries. It's a very, very ugly human instinct, one of the worst. Uh, and it exists in it. It exists in particular American society. It exists still. There is there are still pockets of racism in America, not not legitimate or in any way mainstream. But but there are, there are some people who will hold racist views, and um, but they're all on the margins. Uh, nevertheless, you can't deny that historically America has been a, a white dominated country in which black people were oppressed for a very long time, and until not that long ago. What do you want to do to make up for that? Again, you have the same options as you have on women and other minority issues. You can decide to go for equality or you can decide to overdo it for a bit, uh, overcorrect. And the overcorrection in race is let's beat up on the white people for a bit. So one of the great race hustlers of our day in America is a man who calls himself Ibram X. Kendi, partly to give himself a sort of Malcolm X vibe. And um, he wrote a book called uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, which is a very, very popular book in America. It's flooded everywhere. Uh, there's also a very slightly less grown-up version called Anti-Racist Baby, uh, which explains, among other things, for two-year-olds, that you should talk to your two-year-olds about the fact that policies, not people, are the problem. I don't know if you've ever met a two-year-old, but they very rarely talk policy issues, in my view, my experience. Um, anyhow. Ibram X. Kendi, as he calls himself, says completely openly in How to Be an Anti-Racist, and I quoted in the book, he says uh, uh, the answer to past um, uh, prejudice is, is present prejudice. The answer to past inequalities is present inequalities. You must, you, must, you must rectify historic wrongs by committing wrongs in the present. Is, is, is his message. What's One, wrong with that? What's wrong with that message? <laughs> well... Um, first of all, uh, it's uh, you punish people who look like people who did a bad thing in the past on behalf of people who look like people to whom a bad thing was done. You're not even dealing with victim and uh, and oppressor. You're 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 dealing with people who look like perpetrators of the past and people who look like victims of the past. So that's the first thing. Second thing is it's not going to work. And I'll tell you one reason why it's not going to work in particular, which is that, um, that, that this would be very hard to do if you're dealing with a minority group. And I think if you said to any minority, you're, you're really scummy and worthless and historically you're the only people who've ever done anything wrong and no one else has and you know, so on, and you should think badly of yourself and you should be locked in this bad identity forever and never get out of it. I think if you did that to a minority group, it'd be unlikely you could persuade them into this mindset. Try doing that with a majority group. I think you're doomed to failure. I hope they're doomed to failure. I think they're pretty confident they're doomed to failure. Um, I don't think it'll it'll work. But uh, it seems like it's being pretty widely accepted at the moment. There doesn't yes. seem to be a massive amount of pushback. That's right. Um, I certainly get, you know, when, when you were using examples earlier on of flipping the language around, to talk about black rage or black yeah. tears or uh, blackness that you can't get rid of. Mm. That makes me cringe inside in a way that whiteness doesn't because I feel like it's I've just become so used to hearing that yeah, terminology used that I, 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 I don't think twice about it. Yeah, well, I mean, um, uh, in the early 2000s, the uh, filmmaker Michael Moore wrote a book called Stupid White Man, which I reference in my book. I remember it very well. I remember thinking even then, 2000 or so. Ooh, I'm not sure that Michael Moore could write a book called Stupid Black Man, uh, where there's a chapter in his book 
called uh, Blame Whitey. I wouldn't have thought you could do the opposite as a chapter if Mr. Moore. Uh, he yeah, he says in that book, um, white, show me any problem in the world and I can point you to white people being behind it. Uh, Mr. Moore has not seen very much of the world, if he thinks that. Um but the, the, yeah, it's been prominent throughout our adult adult lives. It's been growing head of steam. It's um, and it's now basically acceptable. And to hell with it. Uh, time's got to be called on it. It's a vicious, vicious thing. Um, and it's not just the fact. The, it's not the anti whiteness, which is just a very, very ugly prejudice. It's that it's being done as a way to attack people in the West and attack everything about the West. And that's why in the book, as you know, I go through the war on white people, the war on Western history, the war on Western um, religion, uh, including philosophy, and the war on Western culture, whereby the same remorseless attack, the same remorseless allegations of racism about everything run through absolutely everything in the culture. So e explain to me how it is that that gets accepted, though. You know, you're talking about the fact that you have this majority. It's mm. It's a... Uh, a critique made of the the largest group of people within the community it is trying to critique, and yet it seems to have been. I mean, here's the thing, though. I think that it it it's been accepted perhaps by um, media organisations and by book publishers and oh, yeah. by authors. Um, but on an individual level, when you speak to most people, I think they would say oh, this kind of feels a little bit icky. Yeah. But I, I don't understand how that's been allowed to occur without well, pushback be because there's enormous um everything i'm saying in this book and a lot of what i'm saying to you now um most people can't say i mean they, they would they, they're just not in a position in their lives to say it you can i can because i don't owe anyone anything i'm a free person and um i can say what i see and what i think and this is a, this is a position of privilege there's no doubt about that um but I know that most people can't say it, and there's a reason, which is that they will be called a racist. Now, I might be called a racist by some people. I'm certainly not a racist, but I, I will inevitably be called a racist by some people because I'm saying something that is true and unpopular. And the only, or the best tool that uh, my opponents have is to accuse people of racism. And for me that's it's ugly it's unpleasant i i dislike it i dislike it partly in large part because it's untrue uh, it's reputationally damaging as it would be if people called me a misogynist or a homophobe or anything else um but i, I think i can survive it i hope i can survive it touch wood uh but most people can't because most people going about their lives getting on with their jobs if they would, if they would have that allegation made against them, it could, it could very easily be over. So, if you're just working in a company and you're told that you're going to do racial bias training, and you're told that you should read um, Robin DiAngelo's work about and think about your white privilege, which John McWhorter uh, called the second worst book he's ever read. read. Yes, it was, a, was a... the first worst book was. I wanted to say it's like a some fan fiction book about something like something completely catastrophic right okay uh but he said it was the second worst book but would be useful to um fix the leg of a, a wobbly coffee yeah table. yeah I, I i think it is up there as among the the worst tomes i've ever had to delve through i mean every page is a... no the 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 the, the, the um, autobiography of rudolf huss the camp commandant of auschwitz was also deeply, I mean, every page, because he, he, among, as well as being a war criminal, he couldn't write. And every page of his memoir is absolutely just... Apart from being disgusting and yeah. brutal uh, and gleeful, it was, it was also, illegible. It, it was also just, like, turgidly, badly written. I, <laughs> I remember when I read that, I thought, that's a terrible, that's a terrible book. And it, uh, um, Robin DiAngelo's book is, is probably, for me, the second worst Impressive. after that. Um but yes, um, the point is, is that if you're in a place in your life where you're told to do these things, you're told to talk about white privilege and, and, and contemplate that, and you said, I'm not doing that, not doing that, don't have privilege, uh, you're very likely to be in serious trouble. And there's, there's lots of people who have been. And there's a, a, there was a partner at the firm, firm KPMG who lost his job just because he said that he thought implicit bias training was crap. He lost his job. He was a partner. 
a big firm, you know. Uh, so let alone if you're one of the poor underlings who has to be put through this rubbish. Um, so, so yeah, and uh, anyhow, it's, it's time that this is stopped, is my view. And um, uh, not enough people are willing to say it, and I am, but it, it's time to stop. I'm not willing to allow people to keep talking about white people as being innately privileged. Uh, they don't know a damn thing about most people. You cannot work out somebody's life, their experiences, their privileges, or their sufferings because of their skin color. It's a gross generalization. It would be against black people. It is against white people. And I think also we have to call time on this ridiculous notion that there are racial groupings who have something to apologize for for historic reasons. Uh, you and I are both fra uh, both brought, born and brought up in the United Kingdom. Uh, we are told now that we have some hereditary um, responsibility for slavery. And, I mean, Americans only have responsibility for slavery. You and I have responsibility not only for slavery, but colonialism. Well, Chris, neither you nor I did anything in the slave era. Neither you nor I did anything in the colonial era long before our time. The British Navy policed the high seas two centuries before we were born uh, in order to stop the slave trade, not just in Britain, but across the world. Uh, the colonies fell apart decades before we were born. So, no hereditary guilt from me, and I hope none from you, I hope none from anybody. There's no such thing. It's a vile idea. It's a vile idea that certain... Uh, uh, it, it would be... A, it would be permissible in a way as an idea if you agreed that everybody bore some responsibility for things that their societies had done in the past that were bad. Do they not? But they don't. It's one directional. It's only a Western thing. And I explain in the book, I mean, like other societies do not do this, and they just don't do this. Uh, China, well, like, China is not currently um, trying to work out what it did historically wrong in the slave era. China um, uh, did as much slaving as, as anyone and still is. Uh, actually, um, um, we have um, effective. We have forty million slaves in the world today, which is more than there were in the nineteenth century. More slaves alive today than there were in the nineteenth century during the slave trade. Forty million, you said, 40 alive million. today. Yeah, I've met slaves. I've met former slaves in Africa and elsewhere. People who are born as slaves. They managed to escape it. Uh, this is not an abs abstract point I'm making. I think that us. Um, beating ourselves up over over a trade which our own country got rid of two centuries ago, and if anyone anyway, should be proud that we got rid of, and um, and so on, there is a significant likelihood we are not dealing with, for instance, slavery today because we're so obsessed with going over again an issue that was closed two centuries ago, and. You know, it brings to mind a phrase uh, of Nietzsche's in the genealogy of morals. These are people who, there's a type of person who, who, who tears at wounds long closed and then shrieks about the pain they feel. Um, we're dealing with a lot of those people at the moment. They do not themselves feel pain from the slave trade. They do not feel pain from colonialism. They have decided to rip at a long closed wound and then cry in order to win something, whether it's pity or money or reparations or something. Everybody would have their own view on it. But um, I, I, I refuse to go along with this idea that, as I say, if everybody decided to take upon themselves exactly the amount of as I say, it's a horrible idea, hereditary sin, but exactly the proportion of hereditary sin that their own society was accorded, then that would be one thing. It's quite another thing when only one group of people, and that white Westerners, are expected to be responsible for everything that anyone who looked even remotely like them in the past did. Uh, big, uh, um, and everybody else is not. I mean, the obvious example to give is... <clears throat> is a point that Voltaire made in, uh, in the um, 18th century. He says, um, said somewhere, the only thing, um, by the way, Voltaire now is one of the many figures who's been torn down literally in Paris. His statue has been now removed by the authorities in Paris, one of the great rationalist thinkers of French society. His statue was attacked so many times by people throwing red paint at it that it's now removed and you can't find it in Paris. Nobody knows quite where Voltaire is today. Um, but now, part of the allegation is him that he profited through shares in some slave companies. They forget, forget by the way, that Voltaire also wrote in Candide, one of the great, great um, um, 
attacks on slavery. But Voltaire says in his own day, he says, well, the only thing, the only thing worse than what the, what the Europeans have done uh, to the Africans is what Africans have done to their fellow Africans, is what Africans have done to their brothers and sisters. And we know uh, from uh, the, the few memoirs we had have of uh, people who were slaves in this period, people like Equiano, or Lauda Equiano, a most amazing man who was uh, ended up British and uh, was baptized in Westminster, became a free man, uh, had most extraordinary life. Uh, memoirs well worth reading. We know from him, for instance, and, and many, many others, of course, that uh, he, he, was, he was stolen by his neighbors in Africa. Uh, in the 1700s, they, um, a neighboring village, they, they came and they snatched them at night. That's what they were, they were people snatchers. They called them. And these Africans uh, stole their neighbors and, um, and sold them. And um, now, um, what is the moral responsibility of the descendants of the people stealers? Um, if white Westerners have taken some guilt, then I would like guilt uh, from Africans as well. Uh, what do you do about African Americans who are descended both from slavers and slaves? Um, what's their guilt, hereditary wise? Well, they cash out at zero. They would. They would come out at yes, exactly. You got the balance sheet. You end up you know, there. Um, uh, if you uh, one when I was researching the slavery section of this book. Um, I got into the very interesting story of the other slave, or the other major slave trade of the t of the time, whilst the transatlantic slave trade was going on, which was the Arab slave trade. And um, the Arabs had a huge slave trade that went on for much longer than the Western one, the transatlantic one. It's thought that maybe 10, 11, uh, 10 or eleven million people were transported across the Atlantic during the height of the, uh, during the whole of the period of the slave trade. It's an appalling thing. It was an, uh, it was a uh, unbelievably horrible. Uh, trade, which people at the time, most people at the time didn't think was wrong because people in the past thought differently from us. And almost, well, almost all civilizations, sadly, at that point, they'd all engaged in slavery. Everyone did slave labor. How were the pyramids built? You know, the, the pharaohs didn't do it themselves. They didn't pay a fair day's were, uh, labor wages to the people who, who hauled the stones for miles. Uh, the Acropolis in Athens was not built by stones dragged up there by Alcibiades. Willing it was, it was, it was, employees, it was, yeah. I went, to a, uh, I went to a church in Florence that was nearly 2,000 years old, and it overlooks downtown Florence. Mm -hmm. And the tour guide was explaining to us, I'm like thinking, the, this building's nearly 2,000 years, and it's been built up over time, but still the foundations are 2,000 years old, and a lot of the, the frontage of it is over 1,000 a, a years old. And I said, well, how is it that people from so long ago were able to make a building which has stood the test of time, he said, well, you don't have the cost of labor. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. Well, I'll come on to that in a second because it's a very, that's a very I important point. Um, but just to finish that thought on the, 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 the Arab slave trade, it was, was about 50% um, more people in total uh, during the same period. So if, if 10 to 11 million or so were taken across the Atlantic in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, it's thought that maybe as many as 18 million from where to where? Were taken from Africa to what we now call the Middle East, uh, Arab countries. Arabia, by who? Arabia. Uh, uh, by the Arabs. Uh, the Arabs traded, as the Europeans did, in slaves from Africa. Now, you may wonder, why, therefore, are there not um, more black people in the Middle East? And there's an answer, which was that this was actually a genocide. Uh, they, um, the Arabs... Uh, deliberately ca or castrated every single male. So any uh, any African male they took uh, to the Arab countries was castrated in order that there would be no more black people. Um, now, does that have a legacy today? Be sure it does. If you go to uh, Qatar, various of the Gulf states, you'll find um, that they basically have a slave labor class today. The Filipinos and others who are brought in and have effectively slave conditions. I've seen it myself. Dubai is the same. Dubai, uh, nobody like FIFA cares about this, uh, but this is the case today. Uh, in um, in uh, Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries, the word for uh, a black person, abid, uh, plural abid, is slave. They still call black people slaves. 
my friend Ayan, uh, who was uh, born, born in Somalia, spent a bit of time in uh, in Saudi Arabia. She was growing up, and they were black because they were from Somalia, and they were certainly blacker than the people in Saudi Arabia, and they were always called Abid uh, slaves. So, so th- my po- my point is not in any way to at all diminish what the European slave trade was or what the transatlantic slave trade was. But it is very, very strange to live in an era where it is presumed that only the West was engaged in such a thing and only we for the rest of time must repay a debt which it appears can never be paid down. Um, And that brings me to what you were just saying about uh, what was going on in... uh, countries like Britain at the time. Well, I mean, didn't you say that the life expectancy of a worker in Lancashire, yeah. England, was exactly half of that of a slave yeah. working you, at the time? The average, the average man in uh, the north of England working in a, in a, in a mill, you know, a mine, they died in their late 30s. So, I'm sorry, but yes, this is different from being a slave. But it's not so wildly different that we are able to talk about those people in the north of England as benefiting from privilege. These were not privileged people. These were not privileged people. These, these people did not have very many life choices of themselves. And here's, here's one of the main points to make about all of this is the past was pretty much hell for pretty much everyone. I mean, even kings died and princes died of diseases, which you'd now cure by a shot a penicillin um but the poor who was almost everyone they were not privileged people and the idea that we have to recast all the ancestors of people who happen to be white as oppressors and the ancestors of everyone who happens to be black solely as oppressed is an incredibly simplistic game and it's unfair and that's one of the main problems about it, is it's just deeply unfair. And uh, when you find an unfair game like that, you should ask yourself, why are we allowing this game to be played like this by people who literally declare themselves sheriff? Well, what's the goal of revising history? Why do it? Well, we revise history all the time, and we should. I'm not trying to stop anyone carrying out historical investigations. Far from it. I say in the book... I, I, I'm not against historical revisionism. I think the revisionists need to be revised in turn because I think they've had too fast and full a run. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not against understanding any of this in the round. What I'm against is trying to understand it through a very narrow ideological lens. And here, here's the thing. Um, I mean, if we'd have been born like 50 years earlier than we were, we would almost certainly have had an education in the UK where there would have been a map on the schoolroom wall of uh, the uh, gl- the globe and the great pink of the British Empire. And we'd have been brought out to say, well, good God, what a great amount of the earth we own. Isn't that terrific? And uh, we're a tiny country below. Now we've got all of that. That's just grand. And the teacher would have told us about these great heroic people who went out and made this possible. Now, that was not history in the round. That was a very narrow um, ideological view of empire. Well, unfortunately, it's also a narrow and highly ideological view of empire to do what we're currently doing which is to say you must only look at empire by, for instance, equating it with the worst actions of the Third Reich. You know, the, 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 you can only compare it with Nazism. You can't say, well, it's a complex thing. Uh, some benefits for some countries, a lot of negatives for a lot of countries. Um and the only people who tried to add any any context and make any of the necessary corrections to the overreach have been just destroyed. Uh, people like Professor Nigel Bigger from Oxford University, in the wake of the Cecil Rhodes affair at Oxford, when there was an attempt to pull down this statue of, 
um, an undoubted colonialist, Cecil Rhodes, who also endowed his former colleague, co uh, college at Oxford, Oriel, as an attempt to pull down his statue. And this professor at Oxford, Regis professor at Oxford uh, in ethics, Nigel Bigger, a very fine man, um, objects to this and says, why don't we, since we're a university, we shouldn't allow these lies to be told about Cecil Rhodes, which is what people were doing. They were making up quotes of things he said, when what he said was quite bad enough. But they invented quotes and said he'd used the N-word in contexts he had and all that sort of thing. And, and you know, Nigel Bigger, this professor, said, why don't we try to set up a course at Oxford where we study the ethics of empire in the round? You know, try to work out a moral calculus, as it were, of what what it meant. Now, that would be a really good and reasonable project. He wasn't allowed to do it. Fellow academics by the hundreds denounced him. Um, uh, how can you even think of trying to put this into context, they all said. Um, and one of the main arguments they used repeatedly was you 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 can't excuse empire because to excuse empire would be a, be to excuse, for instance, the Amritsar massacre, uh, which was the time uh, when uh, British troops opened fire on an unarmed crowd of protesters in Amritsar in India. Not to be confused with the time when Indira Gandhi ordered the massacre of far more Indians on the same spot. Those the two things are not to be confused at all. But the time when uh, the British opened fire and Winston Churchill in the House of Commons denounces it as, a, as, a, as, as um, one of the greatest crimes of the era. He says it's a great stain on the British Empire that such a thing should have happened. And it was. And uh, uh, the um, uh, colonel, Colonel Dyer, who ordered the soldiers to open fire on this unarmed crowd, um, he uh, was put into retirement immediately. Um, you might say worse should have happened to him, but that's what happened. Um, and there was an incredible outcry. Now, um, some hundreds of people were killed at Amritsar. Uh, but again, is it is it impossible to work out what the benefits were for certain countries of um, British presence? Um, is it wrong to think that Hong Kong benefited from British presence? or Singapore, where societies which have flourished, or did flourish in the case of Hong Kong until quite recently, is it wrong to try to work out why the places succeeded, succeeded, and why the places that failed, failed, and what went right and what went wrong, and whether you could find a ledger? That seems to me to be a very good, reasonable enterprise. Why is it that Winston Churchill has been seen as a racist, but Karl Marx has been seen as a hero? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that, because that's one of my favorite bugbears. Um, uh, yeah, well, here's my short answer. Uh, there is an attempt to take down all of our heroes, <clears throat> all of our heroes. Winston Churchill for the British is our hero, our national hero. Only 20 years ago, when we were allowed an opportunity to vote on who the greatest Britain was, the BBC had this BBC documentary. Uh, ten people were, were in the end up being shortlisted, I think, and people presented a program on each. And the um, and the the person who won hands down as the greatest Britain of all time was Winston Churchill, of course. Um, now in 2022, uh, even the, the BBC, whenever it runs a piece about Winston Churchill, has to run like the case for the for the um, prosecution, like ten terrible things Winston Churchill did. Um, they've decided, it's been decided to recast him in a different light. And again, a very unfair light. He's accused of a lot of things he didn't do, uh, such as gassing uh, Iraqis. In fact, he, and this is a Noam Chomsky lie, he actually used, uh, not to get too much into the weeds, but uh, Churchill ordered the use of what we would now call tear, tear gas, gas, not mustard gas. And uh, Chomsky and others have pretended that he, used mustard gas on the Iraqis. That, that lie has gone around repeatedly. There are other, other, all sorts of other accusations against Churchill. But basically, it's because um, the British uh, uh, um, love and admire Winston Churchill still. N not everybody. There are some critics. Um, but by and large, he is our biggest national hero. And, <clears throat> um, you know, when the film Finest Hour came out, you know, there were lots of stories of... Um, people in cinemas at the end getting to their feet and feet and doing standing ovations um and uh, i mean i don't know if you feel this but i feel it very strongly that uh 
Churchill is it's it's not just about him. Um, in Britain, there's a view that and I think it's correct that the world would certainly have um, allowed Nazism to flood across Europe and possibly to Britain if Churchill hadn't have been in place at that time. Who was it that said, this is the one time I've seen the hand of God at work in the real world? Yeah, yeah. Lord Hailsham said, it's the one time I've seen the hand of God in, uh, um, operate in politics. He felt like it just the moment that, that, that Churchill being put into place at that moment was, was just a godsend. And it was. And the other thing is, of course, he, he, for all of our families in Britain, I mean, he was the rallying figure along with the king and the queen um, who showed the British people the resilience necessary to sacrifice their sons a second time within a few decades. Because he'd done what, fought on six continents or something, or five yes. continents, he'd put yes. himself forward for he, World War he One. He volunteered to fight in World War One. Great he didn't hat, need to. fantastic hat, smoked he a lot. Smoked, drank a lot. Um, but he represented, and represents <clears throat> still for a lot of us in Britain, this a sense of what our spirit is, which is um, a difficult, belligerent, unbowed, um, uh, dogged, um, not self-pitying, um, and much more. And so why have they come for Churchill? Uh, I explain the ways in which they've come for him, but my answer as to why is because they know that it will demoralize us. Who's they? The people who hate the West in general, who hate Britain, who hate America. If you take down, they hate people like Churchill being admired. They can't bear it because they know that it's something so deep within us. Now, what is that deep thing? For me, and I think for a lot of other British people, it is the sense that we're a good country, that we did something good, that France may have given in, that with the only shots fired being against French soldiers by French soldiers, but oh, that's good, it's a gloss over that. Uh, you know, the Dutch rolled over. A lot of other countries didn't have a choice and so on and so forth. But the British wouldn't. And this is because we were a good country and we faced up to bad people when we saw them. That is a very, very important feeling nationally. But if you want to stop the British feeling pride in themselves, you've got to take out Winston Churchill. In the same way, in America, if you hate America, you not only hate the fact the founding fathers are revered, and they've been, my God, as I say, say in the chapter on history, they've really come for the founding fathers in recent years. Now, you might say, again, there's a historical revisionism that was needed uh, 60 years ago. People in America who revered Jefferson, say, didn't necessarily know he was a slave owner. Uh, we know today, it would be nice to know something other than the fact he was a slave owner. Um, but the point is, is, if you attack the Founding Fathers, you attack an idea of America. If you take down Lincoln, the victor of the Civil War, and that's also happening, literally, and I've seen themselves with statues of Lincoln torn down in America. If you tear down Lincoln, you go in a similar way to attack the foundation of America. Because if you don't have Lincoln, you basically don't have America. And again, not just because he was a, a good man who won the Civil War and, and, and did this extraordinary thing, not just because of that, but also because his whole story was a story of coming from nothing and becoming president. I mean, he grew up in Abs absolute poverty, Lincoln. Probably had one year of formal education. Everything else, he was self-taught. He taught himself to read books. He was a remarkable man who imbued a spirit of America which many Americans still feel. But if you take down Lincoln, you've taken down the idea of America. Now, sorry, one other point, the quick point on that. Why don't they do it to Marx? Ah. Well, the same remorseless battle is the same remorseless attack is made on every historical figure in the West, on every philosopher of the West, every cultural hero of the West. And it's always done the same way. 
They lived in a time of slavery and did something to endorse it or didn't work against it enough. They lived in a time of colonialism and didn't attack it enough or benefited from it in some way. They were racist by modern standards. This is done against everybody, everybody in American history and in British history and Western history, except for Karl Marx. What a coincidence is this? Um, I, I took great delight in searching the book, finding out the, ma the many, many racist things that Karl Marx said. In his private letters, his private letters to Engels, he constantly uses the N-word, often uh, linked to Jew, profoundly anti-Semitic, of course, um, uh, extraordinarily bad views on slavery, on uh, colonialism, uh, everything else. Um, he said much more racist things than any of the people that we've discussed discussed so far, uh, including Churchill. Uh, and um, yet, weirdly, he doesn't get the same treatment. So if you take out every thinker other than Karl Marx, why would that be? Other than that you're not really just, you're not really carrying out a fair critique. You're carrying out a deliberately unfair critique in order to advance an existing cause. The existing cause in this case is anything but Westernism, and Marxism is one of the answers. And I'm afraid that anti-Westernism has always been um, whipped along by Marxism, ever since the benighted birth of Karl Marx. Um, he, uh, even in the post-colonial era, as I say in the books, but one of the great ironies of the post-colonial era is that anti-colonialists like Fanon, who I write about, all said, we've got to get rid of Western rule in Africa. Now, you could say, well, at this point, we must return Africa to a pre-colonial time, a kind of native tradition, which would have included all sorts of traditions, which would also not look very nice in the light of modern thought. Um, the Obar of Benin was not a liberal Democrat, and, uh, much more. Anyway, but the point is, you, you, they didn't say that. They, people like Fanon said, we must get the Europeans out of uh, Africa and stop the, the European colonialism and capitalism in order that we can institute Western Marxism. Well, this is an oddity at the very least. But as I say, I think it's one of these things. That the fact that people don't apply this standard to certain people and do to others is a demonstration that, we're, that they are engaging in a bad faith argument. The thing that I keep coming back to is the why, right? What the end goal is of this. I don't deny that, it, you know, that I was kind of shocked when we saw statues of people that I thought probably shouldn't have been torn down. Like Winston Churchill seemed like a bit of a, a stupid idea to tear down. What was it? Abraham Lincoln setting free a slave that got yeah, torn yeah, down yeah. at one point. I was like, well, that kind of seems like symbolically kind of beautiful rather than yeah. uh, racist or imperial or whatever to me. Um, so I, I don't disagree that the things that you're bringing up seem to have happened. What I'm the, the leap that I'm struggling to make is like, what's the agenda? Why is this? It's mm. uh, d dissolving the West's love for itself, the attachment of whiteness with Westernness because Westernness had some baggage that came along from the past and then by attaching the two you make the the personal part of the ideological part of the historical part of mm. the oppression why like what's the end goal are you suggesting that this is a a, a slow march of marxism is that who's pushing this i think like one of the people who's pushing it first thing to say is that there is a totally as i as i tried to say there is a totally reasonable genesis to it which is there are things from our past we have not looked at enough and perhaps we ought to understand more fully in the round. There is also a totally uh, legitimate, understandable sense of, you know, were we always the good guys? That's a pretty good question to ask. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, by the way, only the West engages in this sort of self-criticism, but fine, it doesn't need to be something everyone does. So that that's one thing is a perfectly reasonable attempt to get ourselves in the round. Um, uh, my own belief is is that there is there are se several other things going on, and just to limit them to a couple, one is internationally, this is also pushed on us. Uh, just the day before we're speaking, uh, I saw that the. China Daily News, which is one of the Communist Party of China's 
propaganda and organs put out on twitter uh, a cartoon of uncle sam behind the oval office desk uh um, surrounded by bodies and a sort of, you know, Uncle Sam. America's always, you know, been racist and so on. It said, you know, uh, George Floyd and separation of families at the border. It just went on like this. Like, I mean, does anyone really think the Communist Party of China minds about separating families? Does it mind that with the Uyghurs? Does it mind the fact it's carrying out currently probably the worst human rights abuse currently occurring anywhere on the globe, and that's saying something. Um, do you honestly think the Chinese care about the death of George Floyd? We don't know the names of the people killed in China. Of course they don't care about it, but they push it on us because they know that we're that a certain number of us are, re are, are receptive to that. Uh, same thing with Russia. Russia and others have for years encouraged this sense of self-loathing in the West because they have a different sense of themselves. So, uh, so our, our foes and our competitors take advantage of this self-criticism because it is not something that they share. And, they, uh, and then we have this thing of total self-abnegation. What's that mean? Self-abnegation is the desire to rid yourself basically of everything that you have uh, for a culture to get rid of everything because it's all bad. And that's what I try to write about in the culture chapter on this to show that, you know, we're even doing this throughout our culture. I mean, phrases like dead white men suddenly took, got currency in recent years, dead white men. And people could talk about people in these terms. I mean, it's, it's again, dead black men. Oh, that was just dead black men. Who would say that? Who would say that? Oh, that's just the legacy of dead white men. Um, this, this became a, 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 a process of self-scourging in recent years. And... Um, I'm afraid that a lot of it is done by bad actors, bad faith actors, and a lot of, done, of it is done by ignoramuses, I'm afraid. Um, one of the easiest w ways to make yourself look clever in the modern era is just to be anti-Western, to blame us for everything. You call it, uh, what is it reflexive anti-Westernism? Yes, I mean, but, but let's put it the other way around. I mean, that is a sort of easy way to, to, to put it like that. Let's put it the harder way. Um, how easy is it today for anyone in, in the modern West to stand up in a public forum on television, say, and list the accomplishments of the West? Who would do it? Well, it's not like we don't have accomplishments we could talk about. Simply in the political arena, we could just mention the evolution of representative democracy, the concept of one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. A lot of the world's got nowhere near that concept of the peaceful transfer of power, the maintaining of political order, the rule of law. Okay, th this is a very small number of things, but everything I've just listed is pretty big. Most of Africa, historically, the Middle East, historically, the Far East, historically, does not have the, the, the peaceful transfer of power. It's one group oppressing another group and taking their stuff. I think Russia hasn't had a, a peaceful transfer of power through the actual uh, appropriate no. uh, mechanism, maybe ever. Yes, I mean you you could, but maybe you could back to say the 60s that it, or something. well no you well, well it depends how you interpreted the communist party in the cold war era transferring power from leader to leader which was sort of peaceful on their terms um uh, but under a system which the people had no say in I mean you know not at all they you had this quote I think that relates to what you were just mentioning there uh when you are speaking into a great vacuum of ignorance people with malign intent can run an awfully long way awfully fast yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true. They, um, 
uh, if 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 you are brought up to, and I was slightly in this when I was a student. Um, you don't know the world. You don't know very much about the rest of the world. You've not been to much of the rest of the world yet. And when asked anything about it, you've only got this prism of where you come from. And and if you're taught, well, it's us that's responsible for everything, then it's quite easy to just always look at everything through that lens. But it's not a correct lens. I mean, it's it's a lens. It's not it's not a fair one. One of the people I critique in the book, Edward Said, who wrote the book Orientalism, which all, always all students still read, unfortunately, accuses Western scholars of approaching the Middle East and looking at it through Orientalist eyes, looking at it with European eyes. And everyone since Said wrote this is, seems to think this is a brilliant insight. It's not a brilliant insight at all. I mean, what eyes were they meant to look at the Middle East through? Chinese eyes? Japanese eyes? Of course, they looked at it through the eyes of the place they came from and interpreted it as such, just in the same way as an Arab traveling to Europe in the 17th century would have looked at Europe through Arab eyes. Um, there's nothing particularly surprising or racist about that. Um, but in our era, we have we have been, I think, taught that that a, that a, um, a civilized, a, um, a, a person who wanted to sound clever, a person who wanted to be thought well of, uh, and much more would 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 laugh at this would 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 scorn what I just said about, for instance, just some of the political gifts that the West has 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 handed down. Um, George Orwell, you remember from that famous essay, "The Lion, the Unicorn," says that the average um, English sort of English English intellectual, I think he's, it was a particular example he used, was would sort of rather die than stand up to the national anthem, you know. That's different in America, by the way, but there was always something in it. And, that, and, and this, that, that, that observation of Orwell's has often been used to sort of show, well, we have a more subtle form of patriotism, a more subtle form of national feeling and so on and so forth. But there is a form of that that can be very, very easily adapted into shame only. Shame only. There is a version of it which can be pride only, and that's ridiculous as well in a way, just, just to be, I mean, I'm not... As you well know, I mean, I'm not a tub thumping, flag waving nationalist of any kind. Um, I I love my country, and I think it's been a broadly a force of good in the world. Certainly more of a force of good than it has for ill. I think the same thing of America, um, and um, I'm much more pleased that Britain and America had global dominance in the 20th century than say that China or Russia had. Um, and you know, I, I think that I think that for some reason, generationally, there's just been this rebellion against what's perceived to be sort of jingoistic and and simply. What does that mean? What's that word? Mean? Being jingoistic, it were to be sort of nationalist and um, um, you know, uh, only us. You know, the rest. You know, you don't you don't see abroad. Abroad is awful. You know, um, and um, th there has been a sort of rebellion against that 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 perceived trend and 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 there's an understandable one i i would rebel against that if i saw it all the time all over the place you know um uh, but we don't see it all the time all over the place quite the opposite all of our cultural institutions are busy giving up our heritage as far as i can see and as i lay out in the book um all of our cultural custodians seem to me to be doing everything but looking after the culture which they're meant to be looking after well the fortunate thing for black people is that you have blm and the virtuous use of donations that can yes. keep everything on track yeah, you don't need to right. worry daddy's in the hot yeah, seat absolutely how many mansions does that girl who started that woman who started it have now like but she's five. left now right the first lady that did it left the one who's got the five mansions silent or very sort of quietly slipped away i saw after the news story about the six million dollar mansion came out. Do you see that there was an internal memo leaked Ooh, about good. this? Go on. So an internal memo got circulated uh, in an effort to see how they could downplay the fact that the $6 million mansion <laughs> was there. Um, they got caught lying about this is, uh, <laughs> they got caught lying about its purpose, apparently. So it oh. was, I think they called it, they called it like the center Oh, or, I see. Or the hive. It's community center. It's something like ah. that. Yeah, $6 million mansion. Um, mm. And then they had everybody sign NDAs, and then they sent uh, private investigators after the journalists 
that were looking into it. Uh, but when you have a lot of donations, you're allowed to. And one of the things that was interesting, this was reported, or, or one of the um, instigators for why this began becoming investigated was because of some of the local communities that were expecting support from BLM had found that they weren't getting support. So you had people who were struggling to make rent, who were living in these sort of impoverished communities and stuff like that. Uh, and meanwhile, yeah, the original director, CEO, somebody uh, has slipped out, but still in her wake, there is a uh, an aftershock of a, a $6 million mansion. She, she has still stuff. held on to five or so properties, hasn't she? Well, you need to. Yeah, I mean, you've got to go from one swimming pool to another. It's easy to get bored with one swimming pool. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is a hustle. I mean, if 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 no one did you call it them. Black Lives Racket? Black Lives Racket. That's right. Uh, I, one of my roles, I, I write a weekly column for the New York Post, and um, uh, we we uh, ran a great front page on, on this benighted um, news emerged. I think Post were one of the. I think they tried to come for the Post actually on exposing this. Um, yeah, well, I think these people are, um, I mean, you ask about motives and things, and this is the easiest one, of course. <laughs> uh, one another mansion. Um, another mansion. Uh, um, Black Lives Mansions was the fun <laughs> we, 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 we ran. Um, only the post. And, uh, the, um, yeah, the, 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 the impetus for these people is so obvious, so damn clear. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's such a, it's such a, shame for so many reasons you know they like a lot of sort of charity like things they have to present a situation as being worse than it is in order to maximize profits i mean all the gay rights groups do that now i mean i wish they'd all just shut up and shut down and go home uh but they don't they all they all they, they've all got pensions interests you know in vested interests these are all vested interests and they they have to all these groups and blm is a classic stuff have to make the situation appear worse than it is they have to exaggerate the extent of racism in America, for instance, in order to maximize donations. They then have to mislead a load of perfectly, sometimes perfectly decent people, not always, into handing over money. They get corporations to hand over effectively ransom money. I mean, it's a sort of protection racket, you know, awfully nice business you've got there. Shame if anyone accused you of racism. Um, and uh, and then you've got the, 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 the people who... Um, who were expecting to benefit and 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 don't benefit because the whole thing was a hustle. Well, you know, in America, we we have a very clear um, sense of I say weeks we're sitting here, but um, of a certain type of uh, pastor huckster. You know, I read about this in the Post the other week. You know, the, the sort of uh, Tammy Faye Baker sort of figures who who you know. Um, uh, they still go on a bid. Actually, there's one in Texas still. Who sort of you know they like take out huge TV commercials and they say you know you gotta hand over your your money because I just gotta have a helicopter. <laughs> For Jesus. I was in the car. I was in the car yesterday in an Uber, and I, I've taken since I've been here. I usually listen to classic FM uh, to mm. wake up on a morning. What I've found is that when I first wake up, if I listen to music, I can't get the song out of my head. And sometimes right. with classic FM, this can be really awkward because a lot of the music is done to the same pace that I walk at. And that means uh, that as I'm walking down the street, I'm I'm creating the drum beat to the song that I'm trying to get out of my own head. <laughs> so out here, I've taken to listening to uh, um, Keeping Him Close By, which is a local Houston Christian radio station. Anyway, I got in the car yesterday, my Uber driver had a different station on and they were doing a 60 second countdown donation drive uh and saying you know if if you feel moved mm. to submit this money then you can you know it, it's it's going to help it is there for, for a what? good reason for what? i don't know and, and then it was mm. if they got if this particular station that must be part of a bigger network got more money than the other stations that were in different areas in the country on the same network I don't, maybe the presenters won a, a trip to some I don't know but mm. it just felt so it's, icky yeah. to me and that's you know that that's being broadcast on the radio this right. isn't a, yeah, you know yeah. the pastor hookster doing yeah, it to yeah. a small town and that that was that sort of commercializing of mm -hmm. of donations you know using a bunch of psychological tricks a mm -hmm. one time offer a countdown timer yeah, yeah, this yeah. is click funnels from 2006 
right. you know, with a, oh, and here's an upsell for just another right. $5. You can get our free DVD course that you can, whatever, whatever. It's it's a bit of a, a, bit of a tangent. I've got to say, I mean, there's, there's no greater joy than for a, a British person to just sit down and watch adverts on American television. Uh, I once, uh, some years ago, I was in uh, Los Angeles and I was watching a television channel hopping and there was a, an advert from a local funeral home a $999.99 cremation funeral, all in. Uh, offer was only available for another month. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what can you do with that? I mean, Granny, <laughs> look, there's this amazing offer, and I know you're not well. This offer is only on for another month. There is a long set of stairs. If you in were this gonna, house. if you were going to live another five weeks, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of this magnificent <laughs> offer. <laughs> so, you know, Time anyhow. But go. the point is, is that yes, we all know that type of huckster and and and, and you know tin rattling maniac who, who 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 comes from a sort of certain type of tr- so religious. Got a better tradition. Instagram page now. Right, BLM is is one of those. I'm sad that it's taken this amount of time for it to, work, to people to wake up to it. I'm sorry that they did become that. You know, they could have been a civil rights campaigning organization, campaigning for re- remaining legitimate complaints of black see, Americans, but they didn't do that. They just became another racket. Even supporters of them now or supporters of the movement have started to distance themselves by using two different terms, right? People talk about Black Lives Matter, Hmm. to refer to the movement and they talk about blm to refer to the organization uh and as soon as you as soon as i start to see that it's like yeah that won't work that's a, that's a sign of um internal yeah. uh dispute yeah are you concerned about white supremacists using the pro-white narrative that you've got with this to further some pretty nasty agendas that they might have I don't have a pro-white narrative in the book by any means. I'm not pro-white any more than I'm pro-black or anything. I'm, I'm just I'm for people not being told that they're inherently bad because of racial characteristics. We've drawn a line between uh, pro-Western and Western being associated with whiteness. Though, mm-hmm. so there is, you know, we're only a couple of steps away from. Well, because most people in in, in uh, historically in the West have been white. Um, so yes, I mean it's hard to attack the West without attacking white people, or to attack white people without attacking the West. But I'm not making a pro-white argument because I mean it's, it's like what, any more than it's any point in making a pro-black argument. I okay, mean, but let's say it's a pro-West argument, pro-West, uh, and then so. that's then going to be perhaps co-opted by some slightly nasty groups. Well. The, the first thing is is that as a uh, first thing as a as a writer you have responsibility for the words you write, um, and I've been a writer for twenty two years now all my adult life. Uh, you have responsibility for the words you write. Um, other people have responsibility for their actions and their words. Uh, I find the attempt sometimes to make writers res- responsible for their readers to be essentially unfair um i think you write as carefully as you can i certainly do um and will can i guarantee that nobody with unpleasant views will read the book no i can't um i have very large readership which i'm very fortunate to have i can't promise that that you know, everybody is going to be exactly of my mindset or have exactly my tolerant views. I uh, I would hope they do. Um, but I find a sort of a attempt, I'm not saying you're doing it, but the attempt by a lot of people to sort of elide the difference between author and reader to be sort of unfair. I mean, obviously Jordan gets quite a lot of that, the sort of, well, you know, you're read by young incels sort of thing. So it's not, it's not really fair as well as not provable and not the case. Um, uh, and in any case, I mean, uh, as far as I can tell, what actual racists and white supremacists still exist, and there's a little, little bit more of it in America than there is in the UK, I think, a little bit more. But these are tiny, tiny, uh, um, way out there fringe figures. Um, um, wouldn't and don't like me anyway because I won't speak in their terms or agree with what they think. What would be the differences? 
all sorts of things. I mean, for instance, I, I don't tell people that being white is better than being black, because I don't think it is. I think that I think these things are morally neutral states. I think the very idea of saying to somebody that, somebody that they should feel pride in their skin color is as absurd as all of the other claims that you should feel pride about innate characteristics. I mean, look, let's take being a man. Like, if somebody said, actually, somebody did say this to me recently, it's a weird question. But if I said, Chris, are you proud of being a man? I'm like, I. I'm not proud of being a man. I'm not unproud of being I'm not ashamed of being a man. Certainly not ashamed of being a man. But I'm not proud of it because I didn't do anything. I'm not ashamed of being white. And I'm not proud of being white because I didn't do anything. That's one of the reasons why I've always hated the gay pride thing. So if you believe in pride, you believe in shame. Why would you be proud of being gay? Just, just don't feel shame about being gay. It's fine. Just get on with your bloody life and shut up. But the, 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 the what I'm trying to get to is that a white supremacist would say I, and does say, "I have great pride in being white, and it makes me better than these other people." Well, I don't believe that. I don't feel I have any pride in being white per se. And I don't think that being white makes me better than anyone else. But but here's the deal in that. I, and I, I require no persuading that this is my belief, because it's been my belief throughout my life. I was born and brought up in very multicultural London in the 1980s. And, you know, it's not like, it's not like I learned, you know, to be, to have my view. I just, it's, it's been what I've thought throughout my life. Um, if you uh, if you said um, if if but but sorry the point I'm trying to come to is that I don't think I'm better than anyone else because of my skin color or my sex or anything, but I also don't think anyone else is better than me because of theirs. I don't think I'm better than a black person because I happen to be white, and I also don't think they're better than me because they happen to be black. But if some, but if somebody distorts that equation, and a white supremacist will distort that that equation by saying, "No, of course the white person is better than the black person," I think that's racist and horrible, and abhorrent. But I also think it's racist and horrible and abhorrent if a black person thinks that they are better than a white person by dint of being black. Now, the first of those two things is almost entirely societally condemned. The second of those, it's not clear that it is. And I think that many of us can feel that in public spaces where certain people, and everyone is always on the cusp of it, a white person in a debate with a black person is always vulnerable to the possibility that they will be accused of racism at some point. And if they are, that is disastrous. But that is because the black person on the stage effectively still holds this, at the moment, a certain unequal power in that regard. So it sometimes takes people a while to work out, but that in the current era we are in, that is the dynamic. In the same way that a man and a woman debating on stage, it just requires a woman to say to the man, oh, thank you for mansplaining that. Now, the perception we still pretend is that the man is in a position of dominance on the stage. That isn't really the case in our era, nor is it the case that a white person on stage has dominance over a black person on stage. Certainly not. And just to reiterate, I don't want them to have. I want people to be able to regard each other as equals, not better nor worse, because of characteristics over which we have no say. Aside from the problems on the left, which we've been through, do you worry about the trends towards sort of populists or the endorsements of conspiracy theories in some right-wing parties at the moment? Which ones? Well, I mean, the COVID conspiracy theories we've seen that were pushed. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene was in an interesting position. She's such for, an idiot. Um, and is it Bolsonaro? I think as well yeah, yeah, yeah. seems to be somebody that's yeah, starting. down Brazil. I don't, I don't follow very much about Brazilian politics, but yeah, he seems to be nasty piece of work. Um, are you concerned about that at the moment? You know, we've seen sort of Trumpist wing and claims of the leaders like Bolsonaro. Uh, I never bought this idea that there was a sort of populist surge in recent years, because I don't like the term populist and without getting into definitions, um, 
by the, the actual definitions of populism, the most prominent successful populist in the world is Emmanuel Macron. Um, but uh, at the mo in the, uh, the current era, the idea has been that populism is only something of the right, which is, is not really not, not correct. It's also a centrist phenomenon and a leftist phenomenon. So, uh, so there's a certain interpretation of, of politics in recent years, which I don't go along with. A lot of what is called populist is just popular, voted on by the people, and deemed by a certain type of person as being the wrong decision to have come to. Am I concerned with certain things on the left? Obviously, and I spent a certain amount of my life critiquing that. Um, am I concerned with some things that are going on the right? On the right, for sure. Well, like for sure. Um, I think several things have happened in recent, uh, actually in recent months as well as recent years. Uh, uh, I'm concerned about the complete, the, particularly in America, the complete breakdown in trust in any institutions, which is l both legitimate and terrifying. Uh, I don't think I don't know if non-Americans watching will understand the extent to which this is the case, but in America, uh, you know, mainstream conservatives now, for very understandable reasons, do not trust any of the intelligence agencies of their own country: CIA, NSA, FBI. Uh, they believe that elections are rigged, uh, or at least unreliable; that the, the results are unreliable. Uh, that um, uh, the courts are corrupt, therefore, um, uh, and much more. That effectively the state is corrupted, totally corrupted. Here's a problem. I mean, they're not onto nothing. Uh, then you've got the additional layers of the ability of big tech to, for instance, silence even the New York Post, America's oldest newspaper we were talking about earlier. So the tech companies are corrupted. They've already got the media problem in America where people don't trust the media because they see it as being a sort of extension of politics and not a reporting mechanism. All of these things are much more advanced in America than they are in the UK. Uh, and, you know, you have some you have people who dislike the BBC, but the BBC is, is degraded in all sorts of ways, but it's not CNN. It's not seen as partisan, not in the same way. It, it, exactly. People on left and right s s dislike it for different reasons, but it's still got some reporting credibility. And um, in the UK, there are people who dislike the intelligence services or, you know, are suspicious of them and so on. And I'm not, I don't get into that. It makes even talking about them <laughs> sounds conspiratorial, but, but I don't think anyone, in, not very many people in Britain actively think that the C, that MI5, MI6, and GCHQ are not on the side of Britain. But you would say that Whereas in America, sections of the right. Significant sections of the right, as the left, have decided that effectively the state is against the state. And that worries you? Uh, if you don't have institutions that you trust, it's hard to see what conservatives are. I mean, conservatism is innately tied up with trust in institutions. Um, so I worry about that. A, a conspiratorial thinking is definitely, um, I mean, just washed up in, well, in all of our countries. And again, the problem is, with some reason, I mean, look at the whiplash that occurred in most people in 2020 when we went from the most important thing is that you stay locked in your houses and don't see anyone else to the most important thing is to get out on the street in a tightly packed environment and protest against racism. Like When the narrative shifts like that and you're meant to just go along with it, I can see why people get conspiratorial when they're told that they're not allowed to say that the Wuhan lab might have been responsible for the for the, for the leak, and and you're told you're a conspiracy theorist if you believe that, and then a year later the story changes, and you're meant to just go along with it. I can see why people are, or have lost it to a great extent, um, and I'm you know I, I I'm not the arbiter of that. I don't I don't know. I mean, everyone makes their own judgments about whether other people have lost it or not. But it it seems to me that that an awful lot of people have, they've gone down the line of conspiratorial thinking. Is that not the way that a lot of conspiracies work, though, that there's a maybe a kernel of truth that acts as a gateway drug, yes. and then people start to tumble deeper and deeper into this sort of thinking? And it's, sure. it, that's not to say that there isn't problems similar to this on the left, but 
it does seem like the slope may be a little slipperier. I think it's got. I think it's gone. I think it's gone sharper and slipperier faster on the right. We know the sort of left trajectory and have done for a long time. But I mean, it's only like three years since Jordan and I sat down in London and talked about the uh, the way in which the left goes wrong, which is a very interesting conversation. It still hasn't been properly addressed. But 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 you know, we discussed this in London, and I remember we said, you know, we're discussing this because nobody knows where the left goes wrong, but we all know where the right goes wrong. But three years later, you know, it's not clear to me anymore that everybody does agree where the right goes wrong. I mean, another example is look at elements of the right, particularly in America in relation to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I mean, you know, there is a sort of inevitable in internet-like meme of, you know, always go against whatever is the prevailing narrative. Reflexive heterodoxy. Right, exactly. Um, everyone seems to be praising this guy Zelensky. I don't want to praise this guy. Yeah, well, everyone's praising him because he could have done a runner and lived in the south of France the rest of his life. And instead, he stayed, risked his life and the life of his family to stay and fight for his country and inspire his country to fight. Like, that's why people admire him. It's not that hard to discern. Um, uh, let me give you another one that, I mean, just is amazing to me now. But there are people on the right, again, particularly in America and in Europe, it has to be said, not in Britain so much, which is a, a, a good thing, but certainly in Europe and certainly on the right in America, you have people who now say things only used to be said on the left, uh, things like, who are we to say when we went into Iraq and killed X million people? Now, without getting into an argument about the Iraq war, first of all, we didn't kill X million people in Iraq. Uh, we made what turned out to be a, a very inept intervention uh, in which local militias and others and other countries poured in and then were responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths. And it's not a small thing. But the we went in and killed X million people and therefore we have no right to act, used to be a claim of the sort of Chomskyite left. And you now hear it on the right. That that has surprised me. That's happened very fast. Who are we to condemn Russia when we invaded Afghanistan? Again, I'm very happy to have the row about that, but that used to be a left-wing thing. That did not used to be a right-wing thing. Um, and it has become one we spent a good bit of time together in new york which have been some of my favorite memories from my trip so far around yeah, here uh you i mean i thought they were all right you introduced <laughs> me to uh you introduced me to manhattan cocktails which was fantastic yes 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 uh we got into a row with a, a lady at a a show a mm -hmm. uh harry potter show and we had some really really interesting discussions there that i kind of hadn't a side of you that i hadn't really seen before and one of the first things I asked was that you've got five columns a week that you write at the moment. That's correct? Uh, I write an average of four columns a week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, plus media spots, plus writing a book, plus the other bits that you do, plus trying to have a life as well. What is it that drives you to work that hard? Um, <clears throat> gosh, it's a difficult question. Um, I, I do work very hard. Uh, I got to see this firsthand, which yeah. is the reason I bring it up. Uh, yeah. I um, I think I might, might have mentioned to you, I, mean, I sometimes have to register that with myself. A few weeks ago, I got back, maybe it was when you were in New York. I remember I got one, home one night at about 10 p.m. And I remember having this terrible feeling, of, there must be something I've got to do. And I realized, oh, no, there isn't. Wow, I can relax. And it was 10 p.m. at night, and that is not uncommon <laughs> at all. Um, I, I sort of say that one of the great benefits of the life I've been able to create has been that I I, I work in in uh, industries, trades, whatever you want to call them, where I have to work all of the time, but at about ninety or eighty percent. So most people work. Well, let's pretend that most people work nine to five, one hundred percent. Um, and then they stop working and they can do whatever they like the rest of the time. Um, uh, if you do what you love, well, first of all, if you're very busy in the sort of areas I, I'm, I'm in, you just can't do a nine to five job. I mean, it wouldn't work. 
Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I work all the time. Uh, every day I have something. I don't think there's ever a day when I don't. <clears throat> what drives that? Uh, a lot of things, I suppose. <clears throat> One is just being driven. Uh, and I don't know if anyone can explain for themselves why someone why they're driven. I just I just know I always have been. I always had a um, a horror of wasting time. I mean, I, 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 I I'm I'm quite an irritable person. It's one of my um, traits. Don't smile. <laughs> you were perfectly pleasant when I spoke. Okay, well, that's very kind. Um, but in, caught you general, on a good week. I, I'm I'm sl I'm slightly irritable at times. Um, and it's generally because of um, a fear of wasting time. And um, this is very strong in, in, in me. Uh, I can't bear clothes shopping, for instance. I can't bear being in shops, actually, in general. Uh, I get very irritable because I, I just I feel my life going. And I have that in certain films and all sorts of other things. I I just have a very acute sense of life's brevity don't waste it uh, work hard do whatever it is you're meant to do and i've got a pretty clear view of what i need to do and so i don't like not using my time um the uh, the other thing i suppose I'm, I'm motivated to be the best that i can be and that includes being the best in my field um I could always do less. I mean, it's one of those sort of things that your mother says, you know, can you not, you know, can you do a bit less? You know, something you, well, I could, but then I wouldn't be as successful and I want to be successful. Um, I, I want to do well. You know, I, um, if I, if I've got a book out, like I don't want to not promote it, you know, cause I feel like I've done the work. Um, when you refer to my, the columns I write, it's one of the great, you know, great pleasures of my life. I, I get to write for and speak to millions and millions of people in different formats, in different countries, in tabloid newspapers and in broadsheet newspapers and enter into and be in the big debates of my time. And, and I enjoy it and, you know, People generally think I'm quite good at it, and uh, ask me to do it, and um, and, and I get a thrill from it. And and you know, I I said a little while ago to a friend, you know, I wish I could have a couple of days off, and and then I said, I said, I wish I could just like not have to write anything for a few weeks. And she said, No, you don't. You'd be like forty eight hours, and you'd be like, damn it, and bored. You had a similar experience with meditation, I think. That's right. I, I'm very, very bad at meditating. Very, very bad at meditating. Uh, yeah, I think Sam Harris once tried to get me to meditate. And I, I find that I find that impossible. I'm told that there's a way to get through that, but I couldn't get through it. I, I you know, all that thing. Even when Sam said um, it was in Australia a few years ago, you know, Sam was saying, like, "Empty your mind of all your thoughts," and I was just thinking, "I'm so irritated." <laughs> um, I, 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 God, I wish I was reading a book or something. And I, I, I can't do it. And um, uh, uh, it, anyhow, that's my failing. I mean, Sam is is terrific, and and he's brilliant at that, and he's helped millions of people to find a way to, to do things like meditation. I wish I could do that. But in a way, I don't really, because I kind of don't want to turn my mind off. It's always racing. It's always looking for things. And, you know, I read a lot, as you know, um, books uh, and, uh, and things and, uh, and magazines and articles and all that. But I read books uh, um, uh, and I read to relax as well, which is very important if you do what I do. Um, you know, you read to extend your knowledge, but you also read things that just take you out of work stuff into something else. But even then, I kind of read with a pencil in my hand. Even the relaxing stuff is, I have a sight in the corner of my eye. Oh, I have something. a friend who referred to that before you have the pencil in your hand as low stakes consumption. 
Mm. Uh, so it, he, he talks about low stakes podcast listening. That if you're constantly embroiled in the culture wars and you're always listening the newest whatever yes. at a hundred miles an hour, it's kind of nice to just hear about a murder mystery for yeah. for a little while. Yeah, low agree. stakes listening. Um, but yeah. I, this is something that I've been battling with so much, and I, we spoke about this with regards to productivity dysmorphia as well. Mm. This tension between. Um, the fact that you know that part of your drive comes from your ability to pay attention, your ability to constantly be mm. on, to be able to look at the details in a way that other people don't, and that that can actually lead to almost a fear that you go, okay, well, hang on. If I tune this down, mm. that is the fuel that's driving a lot of the achievements that I take so much pleasure in. Mm. And that there's this difficulties sometimes with seeing the amount of work that we've done. And I, I think maybe we almost don't want to see the amount of work that we've done because we think, well, maybe if I took more satisfaction in the work that I'd done, or if I felt, if I felt like I could take more of a break, then that might shortcut some of the things which is propelling me to continue to do this. Well, when you start off, you have to work so damn hard. I mean, I think that's something that is not expressed enough to people, is it? When you start off your career, particularly in a career like mine, you 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 have to work so damn hard. Uh, in the beginning of my career, I didn't have a holiday for seven years. It was seven years until my family persuaded me to go away with them on holiday. I just couldn't go on holiday, and one of the reasons was, I at the at the beginning of my career, inevitably, if people called and asked me if I could write something, I had to do it. If um, I feared that if I said no, they wouldn't come back and ask again. Now that's very common. The problem is there is a certain point in your life when you have that fear and it's no longer relevant. It's information that you're being told by yourself about an earlier version of yourself. And you have the right at a certain point, but it's very hard to make that decision professionally um, to say, okay, no, I'm okay now. I can take time off. I can say no this time. I can turn that down. Well, you also need to. You need to. It's only in the last 10 years that I learned how to say no to things um, uh, because I didn't know whether I'd be asked again. Um, but as for, as for whatever the drive is underneath that, if I could, well, it's like self-revealing, but I suppose there are a couple of things. One is that I've always sought freedom in my life. Um, as much freedom as I can have. And some years ago, I said to I was at a friends and the, some family members were around, and we were talking about various things. And I said, you know, my experience of life has been that um, with every year, I get more and more free. And I just realized I felt terrible actually because I realized that a younger guy who was there said I. I I don't feel that at all. He had exactly the opposite feeling. And I felt sort of terrible that I said this. Um, but it is sort of been my feeling is that I've gone further and further in a way I've gone further and further away from home, you might say. Um, and, uh, but that I've wanted to be free and to pursue what I want to pursue and to have the ability to do that, to write about what I want to write about, to go where I want to go to live where I want to live and to be with who I want to be with. And this is this is something I always wanted. And, and various other, there was a British journalist, Suzanne Moore, said something quite similar in a piece on her Substack recently. And I said to her, I said, it just ring, rang such a bell. Uh, so that's the first thing. And I suppose the second thing I could probably point to is that um, actually it's slightly... I once said to my late friend Clive James, if you knew a great Australian polymath, I said to him towards the very end of his life, he was born in 1939, and opening line of his memoirs, it says, you know, I was born in 1939, the other big event that year. Um, he was an amazing, wonderful man. And But I remember saying to him once, you know, about what do you feel drives you? And he lost his father in the war. He, he didn't die in the war. He lost, his father died on the plane back. The Americans, like, brought some of the Australian troops back home early and the, the plane crashed and you know, he sort of, it was just Clive and his mum then, you know. And I remember I said to Clive once, asked him about his drive and he said, I felt like I owed it to the ruins of my family. 
Um, I do have a sort of sense, it's not to do with family necessarily, but I do have a sense of being born at a fortunate time and having had, I don't say luck because I'm, for reasons I think you know, I'm worried about the term luck, but I feel I have a good fortune which I shouldn't waste. And, you know, uh, most of my uh, predecessors, predecessors of my ancestors did not have very much freedom, uh, economic freedom, freedom to move around, freedom to find stuff out. I mean, I think of the library, you know, the sort of the books that would be on a shelf, you know, on sort of grandparents' age, relatives, you know, they would have very small numbers of books because people, other than intellectuals or very rich people, people didn't have very many books, you know. Um, and I always thought, if I can get the things that my predecessors couldn't or go to places they couldn't, why would I waste that opportunity? Um, you know, can you imagine how frustrated you'd be to have been born in the early 20th century or the late 19th century, not able to leave your village, really, even, and not knowing much about what even happened in town, you know, or let alone in the capital. And, you know, and and with every generation in a country like ours, we've had the ability to go further and further, and it's happened in my own family. And um, so I feel like it's a responsibility Ability not to waste that. Um, but more importantly, I'm just driven by a f desire not to waste time. You know, there's that line of Andrew Marvell, you know, oh, behind my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. I hear time's winged chariot awfully loud. You spoke to me about instinct. I can't remember who it was mm. that gave you a piece of advice about how sometimes it's wrong but at the time it's the only oh that thing. that was clive as well who i just mentioned yeah it, it, clive had great success on television and other things but he um he he once wrote a <laughs> he, <laughs> he once wrote a verse play in rhyming couplets about prince charles and opened it in the west end in london it didn't run for very long uh, i think it closed before opening night <laughs> i think it I think it made it halfway through opening night. I think it stopped at the interval. <laughs> There's no one left, including the cast. Uh, I remember devast he was devastated about this. It was such a, a sort of career humiliation. Um, but he wrote somewhere, I think. He said, um, he said, look, I followed my instincts on it. And your instincts don't always lead you right, but you've got to trust that they are the things that have led you to, to what have been your successes. And I, I've come to to really follow that advice because I've written about quite a bewildering array of subjects in my life. I've written books about a lot of different subjects. And um, uh, I sometimes th used to think, how can I be sure that it's going to work. And the answer that comes back in my head is, you can't be sure. But you've been right before. So the odds of you being right again are quite good. Um, it's like, I find this thing interesting. If, 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 if you wrote about things you found interesting and there was no reception for it, that would be one thing. But if you say, I find this really quite interesting, and you write about it, and you get an audience, and then you write about something totally different, but it you find it interesting, very often you find that's because other people do too. And that's a fantastic thing as a writer. That's one of the best things, it is, um, is, is to be able to, to do it not once, but quite a lot of times on different subjects. Because that means that, that you might have an ability to, and you obviously have this, I mean, you have the ability to put your finger on things that are interesting to other people as well. But that's 
That's good news. Well, you said instinct may sometimes direct you wrong, but it's the only thing which has ever directed you right. Right. And that's a, a price that you need to pay for following your instinct. And you're right. You know, this will be episode nearly 500 or something of this podcast in four years, uh, wow. which is a, a, a workload that uh, is difficult to do on your own. And um, I, I, was, I was reflecting after our conversation about your seven years without a without a holiday i did f 204 saturdays in a row at the same club night without a break every single saturday and mm. uh, that was something similar and uh, there is something uh romantic virtuous heroic old and worldy british about being someone that does the work in that way Perhaps it's mm. my, perhaps it's a cope for my Puritan work ethic. Yes, but we've probably both got a bit of that. But I, I there's something about that that I, that I like. Yeah, I like I agree. the fact that I can look back, you know, in whatever year's time when there's a producer that comes in and does everything, when there's a team that's looking after the editing or the scheduling with the guests, and I know that I did half a thousand or maybe a thousand of them, and it was all on my shoulders right. with with a video guy back in the UK. Yeah, right, is. and there's something beautiful about that. And the other thing that I really adored from when we spent time together in New York that you told me about was a story to do with regrets from Hitch. Mm. Uh, and this is a we're talking about trade offs here, right? And this has been I wrote a newsletter about it, which I sent to you. Mm. And dude, it is it is one of the best insights for ameliorating regrets, mm. for understanding that they're an unavoidable part of our lives. Um, mm. You tell that story about yeah, what he said yes. to you about regrets? Yeah, as Chris Richards, he said, um, I think he wrote it in his memoir as well. He said, uh, he said you have to choose your regrets. Um, I mean, everyone is going to have regrets in their life. You know. Um, I know people who've achieved great things and achieved small things, um, all of whom have regrets. Um, uh, and yes, you, ha you, you, you have to know that you're going to have regrets. And the question is which ones you can bear and which ones you don't think you can bear. Um, let me give you an obvious example. Um, let's say you had a dream always of, starting a shop you know you've got two options in front of you really one is starting it and seeing if it works and the other one is 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 not because you fear that it won't work you'll fall flat on your ass um both both choices have regrets and the sort of person you are relies to a great extent on which one can I bear? Uh, can I bear not having tried, but at least I didn't fail? More than I can bear, I tried and I might have failed. Either way in this, this calculation, you, you're, you are risking a type of regret. So you have to make the decision. Um, I have that all the time with writing. Um, uh, quite a lot of times in my life, um, I've written things seriously against my own interests, you know. And I have this terrible tearing thing within within me, which is, I got to say the thing. I got to say the thing. I just got to say the thing. Don't say the thing, Douglas. Don't say the thing. Everyone's going to hate you. Uh, and I, I'm going to say the thing. And I know that it's because I have two options in front of me. One is, one is, I, happened, I can't give all the details, but it happened not long ago with some politicians. Um, one is, oh, well, that's that. You know, I've broken that relationship. And uh, I have that regret, not that it's a very big regret, actually. But um, but on the other hand, I would have had the regret of I didn't say what I thought. So at least I don't have that regret. Um, but it is, it, is, it is a profound insight of Christopher's because um, 
you know, even freedom, which I mentioned earlier, you know, is not an unalloyed good. It's not like searching for freedom leads you only to a lack of regrets. Um, I mean, my experience is freedom for yourself can be very costly for others. The thing that it made me realize was looking back, I'd always presumed that any regret that I had was due to a suboptimal decision that I'd made. Right. And that had I have been able to go back and make the right decision, I could have avoided regret entirely. I always thought mm. that regret was a bug of my decision making, not a feature, an mm. inbuilt feature of, of being a human. Mm. And as soon as you realize the fact that, look, opportunity cost exists by doing a thing you're not doing another thing and even if the thing that you chose to do was perfectly accurate it was precisely mm. the right thing you're always going to have an open loop around what could have happened had i have done the other thing so yes. when you're given the choice between yes. two things the, the the a good way for anybody that's stuck with the decision is to think which of these two choices could I not bear to live yes. with the regret of? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that has clarified. Absolutely. That happens. I mean, I have that thought all, all the time. I mean, I, I mean, all the time. What, what, could I, um, what could I not bear? Um, as I say, I mean, for me, a very strong one is speaking my mind, speaking the truth as I see it. I couldn't bear not doing it. I would I find it very hard. Um, um, you know, on occasion, as I say, people say to me, you should be a little bit more diplomatic, you know, with this, or you should have been a bit easier on that person. F a very elderly friend of mine often phones me up and says, oh, that's another country you can't visit, don't you? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's about one place you can live in the world. Like, move to North Korea. No, I, no, I was tough on them as well. Unfairly, you know, no, um, no. <laughs> um, but but yeah. So 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 you 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 work out what you can't, what you can't. But then you do realize. I mean, um, I think maybe this is a bit self-aggrandizing, but there is also a difference in people of the risk they're willing to take, which is I don't want to overemphasize myself because I'm a writer, I'm not a soldier. Yeah. or a fireman or a policeman you know um but i think there are there are prices you pay for throwing yourself against the world and um you have to decide whether you want to pay them or not most people go along with whatever they're meant to go along with wherever they are and a certain type of person doesn't. And generally speaking, I think I tend to be the sort of person who doesn't. And that comes with a considerable benefits in my case, freedom, a certain degree of success and so on. But it comes with a certain cost. I mean, one of the costs is um, you always feel a certain sense of isolation, you know. Uh, not to say loneliness, I don't feel like I'm not lonely in any personal or ideological sense, but but it's inevitable that if you don't go along with the precepts, you're going to have a sort of isolation. Um, but then even that, I mean, that you, you, and then you test that all the time. Can I bear that? And some of the time the answer will be no, I can't. And other times it'll be, yeah, that's fine. And other times it'll be, I guess I have to. Alanda Botton says, loneliness is a kind of tax we have to pay to atone for a certain complexity of mind. That's true. That's true. That's not bad, for Anna. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's true. Um, but that's laid on top of, or there's a magnifying effect or a multiplier here, which is the complexity of mind plus the decision of whether or not to deploy this into the real world. Well, again, that depends on whether or not your first forays were received warmly or not. Seth Godin had this amazing insight where he said, uh, 
a lot of the time we need support, but only the first time around. That when you start to get yes. some positive reinforcement over time, you can be you can become more boneheaded. You can yes. become more uh, singularly driven. Yes. But the first time can be more difficult to get through. And I think that's true. Uh, a more troubling one, in a way, is the one that the older you get. I'm now in my forties. I'm forty two now, but. Um, I was speaking to a musician friend the other day who just, one of his um, seniors had just died. And uh, I, you know, on, what was on my mind was on his, which is, is the, the fact that as you, as you get older in your profession, your career, you, you notice the people who you looked to, who you obviously thought were always going to be there go. Um, and then of course you have the ine inevitable thing of, oh hell, that's going to have to be, the position that's filled by people of my generation. And um, there's a responsibility that comes from that. There's also, a, um, there's also when you're starting off, hopefully you will have, I certainly had uh, great mentors and um, um, people I sought out really. They didn't just get given to me. I sought them out to um, help me start off and, um, of course, they die off. Um, but then they don't entirely because that which got you started is 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 you becomes carries you. forward within you, yeah. And and so it is a sort of eternal process of. It, it's what Tom Stoppard in Arcadia described. He says at one point something like, he says, you know, the character, um, the, 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 the student says, um, says to a tutor something like, she says, how can you cope with the fact that all these plays were lost in the library at Alexandria, you know, this number by uh, Aeschylus, this number by that. How can you cope with all these, these things that were lost? And he says, because nothing is lost. Nothing is lost to the march. He says the plays that were lost will come back in fragments or return again in another language. Uh, we we shed as we pick up. Nothing is lost to the march, but all we have is the march. You know, it's a constant process of loss and renewal and discovery and loss and rediscovery again. And Almost every profession I would have thought is like that. Being a writer is particularly like that because you see the people who started you off as they start to fall away. Um, you have and keep certain things they gave you. And there are, for me at any rate, there are connections I feel to people who I never met through people I did know. And now, I feel quite often uh, walking through a library or in a bookshop or something, I feel like almost the whole place is surrounded by friends somehow, you know. Oh, I, and I, I think I knew him. Sometimes it is something I knew, but more often it's like, yeah, I have a connection to that person. There. And so the whole thing is a sort of, is a, is, is like a, a, a constant, Rediscovery. That's what that's what T. S. Eliot saw it as. It's a, it, there are two, I'm sorry. I'm, I sound like I'm waffling, but I'm coming to a major point. I promise. Um, there's a version of uh, history and ideas that is um, common at the moment, which is endless progress. And I never really s believed in that, just innately. I didn't think that things were always getting better. I always thought it was all up for grabs. I don't know why I always thought that, but I did. Even the people who believed in the sort of Fukuyama stuff, you had to have but about two world wars. Those are two quite big footnotes, you know, to a theory. But the theory of progress is most people, including people I meet grown ups all the time who believe in it, they think it's always just getting better inevitably. Um, and they think that art and other things goes along an inevitable path, getting better and better, bigger and bigger, clearer and clearer. 
more and more accomplished. But there's another way of seeing things, which is the one I've just been trying to outline, which is that it's actually cyclical, the whole thing. That, that things are lost and come around again. And that's that's the case with ideas, for sure. I mean, whole libraries die every day in the heads of people. And they will hopefully be reborn in another head the same day. Um, Goethe says somewhere um, in one of his poems about the, the need to recreate that which has been created. Um, and I think that's one of the great noble enterprises, which is to recreate that which has been created to rediscover that which has been, as Elliot put it, lost and found and lost again and again. And everything's like that. All the time, wisdom is being lost. But hopefully it's being picked up again by someone else. You know, every time you lose, you lose somebody irreplaceable. And they're not replaced, but somebody else steps in. And that's the march. Douglas Murray, ladies and gentlemen, The War in the West will be linked in the show notes below. Where else should people go if they want to keep up to date with what you're doing? You can find me on Instagram a little bit. Um, Twitter, Douglas K. Murray. You can find me in the New York Post, The Sun, The Spectator, and various other platforms. Douglas, I appreciate you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.